Quorum of the Board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of August 8, 2017 is called to order. First item is approval of the agenda and order of priority. Is there a motion? So moved. Support. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. There is an informational folder item in front of you, information on the 2015-16 Carl D. Perkins Consolidated Annual Report. No action is required on that, but it is a report in your file. Next, we move to introduction of State Board of Education members and guests. Marilyn, at this time, will you please introduce the board? Yes. Um, the State Superintendent, Brian Whiston, is chairman of the board. Uh, he's the one who's just been speaking, and as we go around the table, uh, Richard Ziley is one of the co-presidents of the board, and he resides in Dearborn. The other co-president of the board, Cassandra Albrecht, resides in Rochester Hills. Michelle Fecta will be at the table momentarily. She's from Detroit, and she's the secretary of the board. Nikki Snyder is from Dexter now, right, Nikki? <laughs> Recent, recently uh, made a move there, um, still in the same vicinity that she was in Pinckney. And she is the board's NASB delegate, that's their association. And the first time officially at the table, Luke Wilcox. He's this year's Michigan Teacher of the Year. And he's a high school mathematics teacher in East Kentwood High School, which is in the Greater Grand Rapids area. And we go across the table, Tyler Sawyer. He represents the governor. He is the senior advisor for education and career connections. And next to him is Eileen Weiser. She's the State Board of Education member from Ann Arbor. Lupe Ramos Montini is a board member from Grand Rapids. And Pamela Pugh is on her way. She's board member from Saginaw. And next to me is the board's treasurer, Tom McMillan, and he's from Rochester Hills. I'm Marilyn Schneider. I'm the state board executive. Thank you, Marilyn. Now we'll go to introduction of new employees. Kyle, please. Thank you. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Brenda Royce with the Office of School Support Services. Uh, do you want to stand up and tell them a little bit about yourself and your role here at the department? Sure. My name is Brenda Royce. I've been with the state of Michigan for 18 years. Um, most of that part time has been with the state police, and then I transferred to MDHHS, and now I'm here. And uh, I work for Kevin's group um, in the grant coordination and school support, and I had, had about 15 years of grant electronic grant management system experience, so I'm glad to be here. Thank you. And I'd also like to introduce Kathy Kaczynski from the Library of Michigan. Hi, I work in statewide library services over at the Library of Michigan. Essentially, I'm an analyst looking to make sure that the programs we offer are succeeding at public libraries all across the state. Before this, I worked at the University of Michigan Library, and I still live in Ann Arbor, so. <laughs> we like that. Yeah. yeah. Quiet. <laughs> Peanut gallery, be quiet. <laughs> all set, Kyle? All right, Vanessa, please. My name is Joe Priest. Um, I come from the K-12 setting. I was a teacher, instructional coach, assistant principal, and principal. Most recently, a uh, principal in Hastings, and I come to MDE um, to work as an education consultant around the educator evaluations, helping to uh, help all educators use those systems to improve our practices for our students. So, very happy to be here. And then from our Office of Professional Preparation Services, we have actually several student assistants who've been helping us give excellent customer service to all of our uh, teachers who need help with their certific certificate renewals and things like that. I'm just going to let you all stand up one at a time and introduce yourself rather than me reading your names and you repeating them. So uh, we start at the end, or wherever start, wherever we want. <laughs> Hello, my name is Isaiah Roberts um, from Grand Ledge, and I assist with of support emails and um, the separation of the different status of the applications. And I recently came from a credit card processing company. Very good. Hi, my name is Tabitha Barber. Um, I do most of the same things that he does. As well, I came from Portland, Michigan, which is kind of near him. Mm -hmm. My name is Ebony. I do everything they do plus more. <laughs> 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 um, I was a temporary employee, now I'm a 
And I'm Braden Walters. Uh, the same thing as the other three. Uh, support emails, documents, and helping people uh, with MOEX. And uh, I'm actually from Lapeer, Michigan. Very good. All right. And thank just a little bit more context on this unit. Um, the Office of Professional Preparation receives sometimes upward of 10, 15,000 calls a month. They service uh, 200,000 educators with certificates. So. Uh, Leah Breen, director of that office, was trying to figure out how to even increase our customer service even more, and we hit upon this rotating student assistant core. Um, so they really, we have a nice little room set up, and they really, uh, it's hard work, you know, to be on the phones all day and help people who are stressed and worried, and they're really doing an excellent job. So we appreciate um, that innovative solution and their efforts. All right, representing Susan Bowman to Shalon. Uh, Shalon Doxey, special assistant to Deputy Superintendent Susan Bowman. Of, uh, Superintendent Roman. I'd like to introduce Noel County from our Early Childhood Development and Family Engagement Office. Noel? Good morning. Thank you for the introduction. Glad to be here. Yes, I am from the Office of Great Start, Office of Early Childhood Development and Family Education. Um, my position is Early Literacy and Family Engagement Specialist. So it's a new job, a new challenge. Um, my job is to collect research and disseminate best practices for authentically engaging families and improving literacy. Um, I'm admitted to goal number five and MDE's top 10 and 10, goals and strategies to ensure that parents and guardians are engaged and supported partners in their child's education. Um, prior to this position, I was the director of early childhood for Saginaw Intermediate School District, so I oversaw pretty much all early childhood programs are in the Office of Great Start within Saginaw ISD, including Head Start, GSRP, Great Start Collaboratives, Great Start Quality Resource Centers, and several home visiting programs. And I'm thankful for the opportunity. Thanks. All right, did we miss any new employees? All right, let's welcome the new employees to the team. <laughs> now we'd ask audience members to introduce themselves, starting with Marty, please. Oh. I'm Marty Ackley. I'm the director of public in the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs here at the Department of Education. Caroline Leithen, a legislative liaison for the Department of Education. Casey Bogart, Michigan Association School Board. Uh, David Clark, Business Development, Pearson Education. Terrence Longer, Superintendent of the Calvin Intermediate School District. Kevin Walters, Supervisor of Rights Coordination and School Support. Jack Butler, Steve Best, uh, Strategic Planning and Implementation. Hi, Lori Tegan, I'm a speech language pathologist, and I'm here representing the Special Learning Advisory Committee and also um, the Michigan Speech Language and Hearing Association. Joel Cole, Office of Career and Technical Education, MDE. Allison Henry here in the Superintendent's Office at MDE. Uh, Vanessa Kiesler, Deputy Superintendent, Division of Educator, Student, and School Sports. Good morning, Kyle Garant, Deputy Superintendent for Finance and Operations. Shaman Doxy, Special Assistant to Deputy Superintendent Roman. Good morning, Sheila Alice, Chief Deputy Superintendent. Wendy Larbeck, Chief of Staff to Superintendent Wiston. Richard. Richard Lauer, Director of Preschool and High School Time Learning in the Office of Great Start. Thank you for those introductions. If you plan to offer public comment at today's meeting, please complete a form and get it to Maryland. Forms are available on the table just outside the boardroom and they must be submitted prior to the beginning of the portion of the meeting devoted to public comment. Public comment will begin immediately following the lunch break scheduled for approximately 1 p.m. today. Please be here at that time to make sure you have the opportunity to provide comment. We now move to discussion items. First item on the committee of the whole agenda is presentation on the 2016-17 Michigan Department of Education Annual Review. This is year two of providing the board and the community an annual review of the things that the department worked on over the previous year. The presentation uh, will be done by Chief Deputy Sheila Alice, and I think she has others that will be joining her. I want to thank the team for their good work in putting this together, highlighting the good work that the department is doing uh, to help Michigan become a top 10 state. With that, Sheila, please. Thank you for that introduction. Good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to share with you the 2016-17 annual review. Every public school and district across the state has a similar report called their annual education report, and they present their report to their constituents at a public meeting in the fall of each year. 
just like the annual <coughs> education report, MDE's annual review is an opportunity for us to share with you, with those who are in the audience today, others watching as we live stream, and those who have access to the electronic version on the MDE website, a snapshot of the work of the Michigan Department of Ed during the past year, as well as the metrics that will provide data that reflects our efforts to achieve our goal of becoming a top 10 in 10 education state in the next 10 years. Think about the annual review as a piece of literary work. It's just as important to read the narrative and work through the plot as it is to know the conclusion or the end results. Actions and outputs tell the work aimed at the top 10 in 10 strategic plan, and they also describe the work of the Michigan Department of Ed staff and the tangi tangible products that were produced through these efforts. The MDE staff were engaged in a tremendous amount of work during the 2017-18 year. We are not able to capture all of that work in the annual review. Only some of the essential efforts and initiatives have been included. So this morning I'm going to walk you through this report, pointing out some of the many elements contained in it. While I am leading this presentation, my Deputy Superintendent friends, Kyle and Vanessa, are joining me at the table. Deputy Superintendent Susan Broman is not here today as she is attending an award ceremony for one of her staff members in Traverse City. So joining me this morning is the Shulan Doxy, who is filling in for Susan. We're glad to have all of them with us this morning. And helping me with my PowerPoint presentation is Alison Henry. At the conclusion of today's presentation, we would be happy to hear your feedback and respond to your questions. We're asking for the delay in that so that we have ample time to get through today's presentation because it is a quite lengthy presentation as there's much information to share with you today. This is MDE's second annual review as Superintendent Whiston mentioned. You'll notice it's significantly different from last year's report. This year's report is designed to reflect MDE's major efforts on the top 10 in 10 and the metrics that we're going to use to measure our progress. This report is divided into three sections. The narrative that describes our efforts and our work with our external partners. The metrics, which provides the data for measuring our products, um, which is also supplemented by the appendix in the annual review and then additional pertinent ancillary information. Additionally, the electronic version of the report contains many hyperlinks. Those are indicated in blue italicized text in the printed ver version. These hyperlinks lead to additional details and background information about the work described in the report. The electronic version can be downloaded through today's meeting agenda or on the MDE website www.michigan.gov forward slash MDE. So let's begin by diving into the annual review, beginning with the narrative section. That starts with a letter from our superintendent, Brian Whiston, to Michigan stakeholders, and it summarizes the work of the Michigan Department of Ed and the contents of this report. Moving on to pages one and two, we have a summary, which is an executive summary of the contents of this report. Moving on to page three, this includes Michigan's vision statement from our top to 10, our top 10 to 10 strategic plan. A vision statement provides us with a description of what we hope to become. In Michigan, our education vision is that every learner in Michigan's public schools will have an inspiring, engaging, and caring learning environment that fosters creative and critical thinkers who believe in their ability to positively influence Michigan and the world beyond. Page three also includes Michigan's education mission. This is also from our strategic plan. A mission statement provides the purpose for why we exist. It answers the question, why are we here? Our mission statement is to support learning and learners. Page three also lists four guiding principles which are from the strategic plan. In addition, our strategic plan includes seven goals which are listed on page four as well as on this slide. By now, you should be familiar with these seven goals because you have seen them repeatedly in previous presentations to um, our board on the top 10 and 10. Our strategic plan also includes 44 strategies. Those 44 strategies interface and support the goals. 
I'm sure that this graphic representation is now familiar to you as well um, because it has been in previous presentations. <coughs> It was created to help organize the seven goals and 44 strategies. It has four focus areas, learner-centered supports, effective education workforce, strategic partnerships, and then in the center, systemic infrastructures. This graphic representation is found on page five, along with a descriptor of each of the focus areas. Page five also includes a brief explanation of the governor's 21st Century Education Commission report. This report was created by a 25-member commission using input gathered from online opportunities and stakeholder input sessions. It includes four goals and 32 principles that form recommendations to ensure that a high-quality education is available for all students prenatal through 20, more commonly known as P20. The development of our top 10 and 10 plan and the development of the Governor's 21st Century Education Commission report used two independent processes about a year apart. However, both documents have a 90% alignment between the two of them. Pages 6 through 24 provide examples of the initiatives and the efforts to implement the top 10 and 10 strategic plan in each of the four focus areas. The information contained in these pages is illustrative of the work done at MDE, but certainly does not capture the depth and breadth of all of our efforts. As I cover these pages, I'm going to do four things. I will introduce each focus area, provide a brief explanation of the components that are in each focus area, give an example of the components, and then what I'm going to do is highlight just one MDE initiative that's included in this report. So beginning with learner-centered supports. To support learning, the educational system needs to develop quality systems around a variety of key components with the five main ones included in this area. So we'll go through each of them beginning with deeper learning, which is on page six. Deeper learning pertains to learning about content and skills that go beyond the recall level and students are learning at a critical thinking level, a problem solving level, and then are working with that content to apply it to real world, real world situations. Examples of deeper learning include AP classes, IB programs, STEM and STEAM programs, and the science and engineering um, standards that are part of our Michigan science standards. In this area, MDE has begun aligning our work around this component with much more planned for the 17-18 year, including the formation of a steering committee that will be comprised of external and internal representation. The committee will provide guidance on how best to assist schools in developing programs that allow students to dig deeply into the subject area and to, plot, to apply the knowledge and skills gained in the subject area to real world situations. The next component is personalized learning, also on page six which is individualized to the learning styles and the interest of the student. It allows multiple pathways for a student to sh demonstrate that the, they have met their learning outcomes. Examples include dual enrollment, competency-based learning, early and middle college, as well as online and blended learning. In this area, MDE has partnered with MAISA and its General Education Leadership Network to work on ways to support schools and districts with the implementation of competency-based learning, which is one example of personalized learning. The partnership was formed earlier this year to implement a pilot project that was outlined in this year's budget bill. The pilot po project will be competitive, it will be open to all schools in Michigan and have a three-year funding commitment from our legislators. It will allow us to support districts interested in beginning this work. Criteria is being formalized um, to bring to you for approval and a draft application process is in the works. Additionally, we are working with MAISA to build a network of interested school districts to explore competency-based learning, what it involves, and what it takes to move a district forward in this initiative. Moving on to page seven and differentiated supports. Differentiated supports acknowledges the diversity of the learning needs and the challenges of each learner and it provides individualized supports to support those students as needed. Examples of this include multi-tiered systems of support, 
otherwise known as MTSS, um, as well as interventions that support students that have special needs. For this component, MDE has partnered with three ISDs for the implementation of MTSS. We have partnered with Lenaway and Saginaw ISD to scale up the efforts of MTSS with three local districts in each of those ISDs. And we are partnering with Ingham ISD to share and learn from each other as we move forward with our implementation of MTSS. Moving on to page eight. Page eight provides examples of aligned curriculum efforts. Aligned curriculum provides a coherent and a developmentally appropriate learning sequence that addresses quality learning standards. Examples of this include the tight alignment between curriculum, instruction, and assessment, because we know the tighter those three components are aligned, curriculum, instruction, and assessment, the more successful students are in the classroom. Another example is evidence-based practices that are used during the instructional component of the lesson design. MDE is continuing its effort to provide support to schools and districts as they implement the new science standards that were adopted by the State Board of Education in November 2015. And we are finalizing draft social study standards, which we plan to bring to the State Board for your review and approval later this year. And the final component in the focus area, this focus area, is feedback, which is included on pages eight and nine. Feedback provides information for each learner that will help adapt learning approaches and understandings in order to improve the learning outcomes. Examples of this include formative assessment and mentoring and coaching. The department has been working with a group of stakeholders to create a, free, a feedback framework and now is in the process of identifying scenarios for use with various feedback groups. The next step in the implementation process is to acquaint all of the MDE staff with this feedback framework, and we have that planned for next month. We also plan to bring this initiative to our partners across the state during the coming year for their input as we develop a statewide implementation plan. Moving on to the next focus area, which is effective education workforce, and that begins on page nine. Michigan recognizes that the primary support for student learning is the educator, and that we cannot build a quality education system without having an effective education workforce that is well prepared and supported. The first component in this area is the development of new educators and leaders, which focuses on the ongoing efforts to develop the educator pipeline to ensure that quality educators are entering the profession and that they have the competencies needed to be effective in the field. Examples of this include high quality placement for pre-service teachers and high quality mentors for new teachers and administrators. Several major educator effectiveness initiatives related to new, to new educators were carried out this year by the Michigan Department of Education staff, including research and implementing several residency-based clinical programs in partnership with education preparation programs and the K-12 system. The next component is supporting, support for practicing educators and leaders, which is with details provided on pages 10 and 11. We know that the role of the educator is developed and improved over time through the experiences and the pro professional learning opportunities that they have. Examples of this include professional learning opportunities and programs that are aligned to Michigan standards for professional learning. In September of 2016, MDE launched the Proud Michigan Educator Campaign designed to support the prestige of the education profession by recognizing the incredible efforts of educators across the state and by contributing to the improvements in educator morale and retention. <coughs> Eight video vignettes recognizing ed educators were released this past year, and we have three more videos planned for release shortly. The final component in this focus area is equity across the system, as indicated on page 12. Equity ensures that all learners have equal access to quality educators and that educators have the appropriate support, resources, and work environment that they need to teach their students. Examples of this include the attraction and retention of quality educators and being able to provide incentives for becoming a master teacher. 
Through our partnership district model, MDE is, has teamed and is working with individuals within the nine partnership districts to identify talent man management needs and to craft individual solutions so that these districts that have the greatest needs have access to the greatest supports, including access to the best educators. For the coming year, we plan to begin the process of defining equity and what equitable access means. Moving on to the next focus area, which is strategic partnership, beginning on page 12. Michigan's educational, educational infrastructure is not relegated to just schools and leaders and teachers, but rather includes a variety of stakeholders who need to collaborate with and support our children. The first component is district partnerships, which is included on page 12. MDE is partnering with school districts to support challenges they face in implementing initiatives with fidelity and to learn how better to serve them. Examples of this include the partnership district model and MDE's collaborative efforts with Lenaway, Saginaw, and Ingham ISD to implement evidence-based practices such as MTSS. This past spring, MDE initiated a partnership model designed to support the districts with persistently low performing schools. This model helps district to draw on an array of technical assistance, expertise, and resources, and it partners with stakeholders to improve schools. This mo model also calls for each district to develop a partnership agreement and to take the lead in developing, implementing, and evaluating the goals, the benchmarks, the strategies, and activities included in their agreement. MDE liaisons and cross-office experts provide continuous support to ensure district success. The next component in this focus area is parent, family, and community services, which is on pages 14 and 16. This includes collaborations with individuals and organizations that support the whole child. Examples include PTA's National Standards for Family School Partnership, as well as access to free human services and family advocacy supports. This past year, MDE has been working with local, state, and federal partners to support the children and families of Flint as part of the ongoing efforts to address the challenges brought on by the Flint water emergency, such as expanding child development and care access, providing an improved summer food service program to reach more children, and partnering with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services to provide additional food assistance for families affected by the emergency. Also on page 16 is post-secondary higher education access, another component of this focus area. It includes partnerships with institutions that support educator development and are the transitional stage in learning for those le leaving the prenatal through 12th grade system. Examples include early college, middle college programs, articulation agreements between colleges and career and technical education programs, otherwise known as CTE. The Michigan Department of Ed Head Start State Collaborative Office provides continual leadership for Michigan's early EDU team, which focuses on providing high quality online literacy degrees to early childhood workforce. This past year, Mott, Mott Community College created an online child development associate credential and enrolled a cohort of high school students in this program. This cohort of students received their, development, their child development associate credential as well as college credits before graduating from high school. Also on page 17 is workforce preparation. This is the final component in this focus area, and it includes partnerships that support the transition of learners from the classroom into the workforce. Examples include work-based learning and service learning for students, as well as CTE programs. Both the governor's office and our state superintendent have been promoting CTE instruction as a viable instructional option for all Michigan students. Additionally, at the end of June, our superintendent signed an executive, director, executive directive on alignment of CTE coursework, standards, and curricula at the local district level. In the coming year, 
department staff in the Office of Career and Technical Education and the Office of Education Improvements and Innovations will be working with CTE centers and districts to ensure that the work done in the CTE centers is applicable to meeting graduation requirements. Pages 18 and 19 include additional partnerships MDE has with other state agencies and external organizations. Moving on to the fourth focus area, which is systemic infrastructure, which begins on page 19 and continues through page 24. All systems need an infrastructure to run. Stakeholders told MDE during the input sessions that led to the development of our ten, top 10 and 10 strategic plan that imp improvements were needed in the infrastructure system beginning from the building and classroom level right through to the state education agency. One of the components in the focus area is governance found on page 20. It includes protocols and decision making practices using data and other relevant information and aligned with other initiatives. To make this happen, we needed a systemic way to bring our work forward in MDE. Thus, way of work, as reflected in this graphic, was created. It is a critical piece of reorganization as it helps to build a system of cross-office collaboration for doing our work. It includes considerations such as defined effort, resources, communication, data and evaluation, and professional learning and technical assistance. The four outer considerations interface with the defined effort as well as each other as depicted in this graphic. Work groups have been established for each of these four way of work considerations. The work groups are in the process of developing processes, protocols, and procedures to bring coherence, consistency, and structure to each of these considerations. Once the work groups have developed the new tools and practices for their consideration, they will share them with all of the MDE staff and support in implementing them will be provided. There are additional way of work co components that are included on pages 21 through 24. However, for the sake of time, I'm not going to cover the remaining ones except to say that they represent a specific system within the organization's infrastructure. This concludes the narrative portion of the presentation. I'll now move to the metrics portion, which begins on page 25. Implementation of the strategic plan included identifying metrics to measure our progress. Currently, we have six metrics, otherwise known as the six E's, which are listed on this slide. As we continue to refine our implementation efforts, it's also probable that we will, re we will revise our metrics. Um, they will evolve as we evolve in the implementation of our strategic plan. The data that is presented in our report this year is our baseline data. As we go forward, we will add results in the coming years for comparison purposes that will help us measure our progress over time. There are two types of data sets. They are listed on the bottom of page 25. They include state to state comparison data and then state, state and local data. As I review the metrics portion of the report, I'm going to do the same thing as I did with the narrative portion, which is I'll identify each metric, I'll list the data available, and then I will point out only two of the metrics. Page two, uh, sorry, page 26 includes the first E, which is the early learning metrics. We know that early learning can be difficult to measure, so we've identified three major areas in this area in this for this metric: the early learning access, student engagement, and early grades as well as early literacy and mathematics proficiency on the M-STEP for third grade and the National Assessment of Educational Progress or NAEP for fourth grade. In this area, I'm going to highlight the student engagement data set. For this metric, we're using an overall student attendance in kindergarten through third grade, which was 94.2% during the 2015-16 school year. At the same time, we're monitoring students who are chronically absent which is defined as being absent 10% or more days of school. For 2015-16, the number is 14.4%, or almost one of seven students who were chronically absent. Moving on to student proficiency, 
We're looking at third grade MSTEP for English Language Arts or ELA and math results for the 2015 school year, which is the most recent data that we have. For ELA, the proficiency <coughs> average was 46% for 2015-16, and for math, it was 45.2% for the same year. Moving on to the second E, which is exit ready on page 27. For this area, our focus is on opportunities and outcomes for students who are transitioning to a career or college after high school. We have three data sets we're looking at. We're looking at national student assessments. Um, it's the eighth grade NAEP for reading and mathematics and the SAT results for 11th graders. We're also looking at high school graduation rates and CTE completion rates. Today I'll highlight our baseline data for CTE completers, which is 37,143 students for the 2015-16 school year. And I'll also highlight our SAT scores for 2016, which includes a combined average of 1,001, and that uses the results from the math and the evidence-based reading plus writing scores. Our average, our, our, our average math score was for 2016 was 494, and our average reading writing score was 507. The next E is engagement on page 28. For this area, we're using the underlying principle, the underlying principle that a student must be fully engaged and present in the learning environment in order to be successful. We've identified two data sets for engagement. Our first data set is attendance and absenteeism. Um, that's for kindergarten through 12th grade. Here our baseline data indicates that 14% of the student group was absent 10% or more days of school during the 2015-16 school year. Our second data set is college enrollment for high school students um, who graduate and then enroll in college within one year of graduation. Our baseline data reflects that 69.6% .6 of our high school grads in 2015 enrolled in a college within one year of their high school graduation. Measuring our progress um, for the next E, Effective Educators, is on page 29. Here we're using two data sets, one for outcomes, which is based on the results of educator evaluation, and one for inputs, such as the number of individuals in a specific field. For educator evaluation, 98% of our teachers were rated either effective or highly effective during the 2015-16 school year, and 97% of our state's administrators were also rated either effective or highly effective during the same year. Moving on to early literacy coaches, the early literacy funds were used to provide 95 literacy coaches at our ISDs and 802 literacy coaches at this district level this past year. The fifth E is equity on page 29 and carries over to page 30. For these metrics, we're doing a deeper analysis of metrics used to recognize potential inequities in resources and supports, as well as to identify achievement gaps in student proficiency. Here we have two data sets. The analysis of systems inputs using ratings from two external groups, Education Week and the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and the analysis of subgroup outcomes on our state assessments, both MSTEP and SAT. Looking at the Education Week 2017 Quality Counts Report, Michigan ranks 34th when compared to other states based on multiple factors, including early foundations, academic measures, and adult outcomes. The annual review also includes an appendix um, in which we provide subgroup proficiency results by grade and content area tested for both the MSTEP grades 3 through 8 and the SAT for 11th grade. And our final E is efficacy, which is listed on page 30. Efficacy metrics allow us to evaluate the effectiveness of implementing systems and programs to determine if the implementation of that program or initiative um, was done with fidelity. And we do this by examining diagnostic, operational, and benchmark metrics during the course of implementation. 
For the 16-17 school year, we do not have any baseline data. However, it is our plan um, that our team that is implementing MTSS um, to collect data points along the way throughout the coming year that will measure the fidelity of implementing MTSS in the districts um, that have been selected by Saginaw and by Lenaway um, to determine the effectiveness of that implementation process. This concludes the metrics portion of the presentation of our annual review document. We'll now move into the final section, which is additional pertinent information. Pages 31 and 32 of the report describe Michigan's plan for the Every Student Succeeds Act and the process that was used in the development over this past year. Michigan's ESSA plan was developed with the input of thousands of Michigan stakeholders through their participation on action teams, advisories, and review committees, respons responses to multiple online surveys, attendance at regional feedback forums or presentations, and as part of the formal public comment process. Michigan's ESSA plan is aligned to the state's top 10 and 10 strategies and goals. Our plan was submitted to the U.S. Department of Ed this past spring. It was reviewed and feedback was recently provided by the U.S. Department of Ed. We are currently in the process of providing additional details to the plan based on the feedback that we received and we plan to submit our updated ESSA plan to the Department of Ed by the end of this month. Pages, 20, pages 33 and 35 provide selected facts and figures related to Michigan's education system. These include the number of students, schools, and districts in our state, educational funding, class size, as well as data related to student testing, CTE and early childhood programs, along with school and summer meal programs. Pages 35 and 36 of the report provide examples of the positive feedback, just some of the positive feedback the district has received over the year, as well as highlights of our outreach efforts in certain areas. Custom, customer service continues to be a top priority for MDE. Page 37 highlights someone that you are all familiar with, the 2016-17 Teacher of the Year, Tracy Hordisky. Details of the Michigan Teacher of the Year program and a link to Tracy's blog featuring highlights of her experiences over the past year are included. Members of the State Board of Education and a list of board actions taken this past year are listed on pages 39 and 40. Reference information provided in the last several pages of the report include a list of legislative actions impacting the state education system enacted this year, a list of some of the most recently access MDE hosted or sponsored web pages and a list of the MDE leadership team with links to their content information, uh, contact, contact information in the electronic version of the report. The appendix of the annual review contains the most recent proficiency and growth data across all subjects tested for all grades and subgroup areas. The creation of the 2016-17 annual review was truly a collaborative effort. Many MDE staff played a role in the development of it, and I'd like to acknowledge and thank the staff who contributed to the content, the text, and the data for inclusion in the report, the others who proofread and reviewed the, this document. Alison Henry for coordinating and organizing the content, Shannon Velasquez for formatting the layout, and the graphic design, and Mike Flaminio for developing the slides for today's PowerPoint presentation. I'd also like to recognize the leadership of the State Board of Education, as well as our superintendent, for their ongoing encouragement, support, and endorsement of our top 10 and 10 strategic plan, um, and all of the efforts surrounding the work in, that we do at MDE. And there are many, many staff whose work whose efforts and contributions were included in this report. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, it's not possible to include in this report all of the work on the top 10 and 10 conducted at the MDE. There's just too much of it, therefore we chose to select and share initiatives and efforts that, rep that represent the different offices and units within our agency. We're very proud of the strides that we made this year 
towards achieving and moving us forward in the top 10 and 10 strategic plan. We also know that we are looking forward to moving our state closer to becoming a top 10 and 10 education state in the next year with our efforts that we have planned. We thank you for this opportunity to share with you the many highlights that are included in our report, and we would be happy to listen to any feedback that you have or respond to questions that you might have. Any questions or comments from the board? Eileen, please, and then Cassandra. My dad was a newspaper editor, and uh, I spent probably five hours yesterday and the day before looking at this report. It's phenomenal. I was going to estimate how many words there are in it that were carefully chosen, maybe 42 bazillion. Um, uh, the only comment, uh, there was one passage that I read that I didn't understand, but I can't find it and I forgot to notate the page, uh, the page number. And to say that to you with the complexity of the information offered is spectacular. Um, the only uh, one, the one editorial comment, I've got editorial, not content, um, is that on page 26, um, uh, it talks about in early literacy and math, early learner outcomes on state and national assessments can be used to gauge learner progress. It's clear from the addendum that it is being used. Um, on the next page it says NAEP will be used to gauge. So I think if you're going to do it, you just may want to change it to will at some point. But thank you so much for a clearly um, extraordinary realignment of the department listening to the hires, the people who, their backgrounds, very different. I know that there are huge issues uh, for the department on hiring people from uh, K-12 because of the lack of continuity for, um, for pensions and other benefits. I commend the department on being able to recruit these kinds of people because it's exactly what our schools need. Thank you. Thank you. And if you find that part of the <laughs> annual review <laughs> that wasn't clear, will you let me know so we, been so, we can, so we can correct it? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was only because I didn't understand whether it was students or teachers who were the target <coughs> audience. Um, trust me, I couldn't find it again, so something must have clicked. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Cassandra, then Richard, please. Uh, so thank you for pulling this together. It's wonderful <coughs> information, very, very helpful. Um, I just had one area that, that sticks out to me. Uh, and I know I've mentioned this before, and I'll probably mention it again many, many times, um, but it, it's the competency-based learning um, piece of this. It, it, my fear is in education, we always have these shiny new objects, and they become like the, the big gold standard at the time, and then we spend all this time going into this and then find out actually that, that wasn't really the what we thought it was gonna be. And in here it says companies Competency-based learning looks at how students acquire and demonstrate mastery of content by area. I'm not sure that's true. I think competency-based education is like checking off boxes. And it's not about content. And I'll give you an example. Um, I've been checking out, because I'm a glutton for punishment, another <laughs> master's program. <laughs> uh, because I want to teach part-time as well and I don't want to teach in the area that I have a PhD in so I've been looking at another master's program and uh, I decided well what the hey I'll, I'll check some competency-based programs as well because they're online and they're supposed to be less expensive by the way it was more expensive than Wayne State University uh, but when I asked the uh, the folks there about what what is a competency explain it to me what they said is, well, you know, a competency might be you write the beginning of your paper. And then the next competency <coughs> is you write the, the conclusion of your paper. This is a master's program. To me, that's like high school. So for that to be considered the competency was n at no point did they say demonstrate you know what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> or what is the content of this paper it was all about can you check the box that you can write a paragraph and so my concern as we're heading down this road of competency-based education is we want everyone to have this tailored education which to me says computer-based um, which in and of itself could be a, an issue as well but that at the end of the day, are, what are we really measuring? Are we measuring the fact that you can write a sentence, or are we measuring the fact that you understand what it is that you wrote that sentence about? 
And to me, that's, that's way more important. Um, so I, I'm really concerned about this push that we have towards competency-based um, learning. And my question with it is, what happens you know, when you think of competency-based education, you think about the students who want to propel forward, and they, and they, why should they be in high school for four years if they can master this? But we never think about the students who don't propel forward. What happens when they reach age 19 and they haven't hit those quote-unquote competencies? What happens to those kids? So I, I'm, I, I don't expect you to necessarily answer this today, but I'm going to keep expressing this as a concern because what I've seen in higher ed I would not want translated to K-12. I think what we'll do is maybe provide some opportunities to share with you some of the competency-based programs that are out there and show you that they're not the way you described them, but they're really about here's what we want kids to know and be able to do, and here's how they're going through the process, and they have to demonstrate that they can do the math, the language arts, the science, the social studies. Um, so I, you raise a good point, and we'll find opportunities to show you some good programs that we think will highlight. But I also say competency based isn't for everyone. I mean, I think what we say is you, we want to create multiple pathways, and I know Dexter has a program for <coughs> kids can choose between a traditional classroom and a competency based classroom, and because you know the needs of each student is different. Good points. We'll we'll work with you on it. Thanks. Richard, please, mm -hmm. and then Tom. Um, Yes, I, let me echo the, the comments uh, made earlier uh, on uh, how well put together this report is and, and a comprehensive plan, and I'm, I'm feeling like I can wrap my head around the, the top 10 and 10 uh, uh, in a way that I, that I wasn't able to before. Um, I had uh, one or two questions that came up. Um, one was in the matter of, of deeper learning, and um, uh, specific programs like AP and STEM and STEAM uh, were mentioned, but uh, aren't all classes ultimately concerned with deeper learning? I mean, isn't that a, a philosophy that pervades instruction at all levels as opposed to being manifest primarily in certain programs or classes? The answer to that question is yes. Okay. Right. Um, On the competency-based learning, my question is, how is this assessed? Is there a, is there a, a manner of assessment uh, that differs for competency-based learning that's different from traditional instruction? I think, um, so I, that's a good question. I think there's, at the core of competency-based learning or education is that it's assessment closer to the learning uh, event. So it's more uh, micro-assessments, block assessments, a mix of formative assessments. I think. One of the things as we move forward with certain districts who are doing competency-based, and we have an opportunity to pilot with some districts, one of the questions will be, well, what assessment supports do you need to do this more effectively? What are some of the barriers with the way we, we might do it now? What are you trying to do? What, what tools could we utilize together? So um, it depends on you know, how, which competency you're talking about and how you want to assess it, but it's certainly a, a blended approach of a child being ready to move forward. Uh, to Cassandra's point, though, students are still expected to meet grade level standards reasonably on target. It's not competency based, doesn't mean you end up at 19 not able to read. It means you move forward at your own pace. So I think it's an emerging science about how to best assess competency based. And because it is so um, tailored, it, a one size fits all approach isn't, isn't necessarily going to work. So we look forward to working with districts that are working in that space to, to th think how the state can support them. Okay. Um, on page nine, uh, talk about uh, teacher support. I, I think that the I think that the point has to be made that the support that teachers need is primarily from the parents, and you need the support of your your students' parents in the classroom. And I I don't I don't think that other institutional supports, as praiseworthy and necessary as they may be can really substitute for that. I, I think if we, if we fail to acknowledge that in our plan, then we're setting ourselves up for, for failure. Um, so I, I guess Very good point. I'd like to see that a little more, more, pro more prominent. Um, uh, 
after all this, my, my overall question is, um, uh, well, let's go to a piddly, a piddly one here. But I, I was very curious. Mott has an online program to teach child care workers. How can you teach child care <laughs> skills without supervision? That's a good question. I mean, uh, I mean that, that's, that's, the, that's the missing ingredient in online instruction. That's why I think online schools probably should get only half the tuition and not all of it, because they're only delivering half the job. Someone else is delivering the supervision. So, no, no thoughts on that. Okay. Um, I think we'll have to get back to that one. Okay. All right. Um, and as I say, my, my overall question is what and I think it was illustrated by your observation that 90% of the Governor's Commission and, and the top 10 and 10 uh, were already aligned. Um, what percent of what we were doing um, five years ago is aligned with, with this top 10 and 10 plan? I guess it's a question as to how, how much this represents what we've already been doing and how much of it is really new. Well, I mean, some of it is brand new and some of it is highlighting the best practices that have been out there in a handful of districts that the research shows has been successful and we want other districts to learn from that. So some of it's new, some of it is research-based that districts have done that we want to learn from. But I don't know if we can come up with a percentage or anything. I guess I'm looking sure. for elements of continuity and what you've just shared is that the continuity is with what we've observed seems to be already working and 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 I think that makes sense yeah. well, if I can uh, I, if I can offer an observation having kind of been here through a couple strategic plans possibly uh, an example might be personalized learning or the anytime anywhere any pace any place that idea we've been working on that for several years this plan takes certain elements puts more specificity around it aligns with the governor's commission creates more of a um, a focus on it and also um, the legislature for example made an investment into a com competency based education pilot so I think it's getting taking some big ideas and starting to move into some pilots and implementation further down so that's a place of continuity with new development and the field meanwhile has been doing their own work so how do we as the department bring in best practice and align with goals and, and keep moving forward so there are new things there are building on foundations um, there's a, there's a mix of both. Okay. And I guess a related question, how similar or different is this plan from what other states are doing? Well, when we came up with Top 10 and 10, and I know the 21st Century Commission for the Governor, we looked at Massachusetts, Florida, Tennessee, and other successful countries, and I think it's very much in line with what a lot of those other states and countries who are performing very well have done. I mean, I think that's what we learned from them. But it is aligned to them. All right. Okay, thank T you. Tom, then Michelle, please. I, um, I had just one dog-eared page and it happened to be what Cassandra brought up. Um, the, con the personalized learning, and is it a new shiny object? I'm, I'm afraid it's, it's uh, kind of the flow is that it's moving in this direction and it may be more long-term unless we really step up and challenge it. And um, I you know, see more and more that it's just, uh, I don't know, it, it almost makes me wonder if there's, if teachers are going to become less relevant uh, because we're just focused on the computer and checking the box. And, you know, I have al I've always said that it's got to be difficult when you have 30 kids and 10 of them are in the average and 10 are below and 10 are above. And how do you, how do you tailor education to that? I think this is, might be the answer to some is to put them in front of a computer and let the ones you know, check boxes quicker and others check boxes slower. Um, but I still, I wonder if, um, if we're getting away from that important uh, teacher uh, interaction. And, you know, there's other ways to do personalized learning. I would imagine you can kind of sort the kids about where they're, where they're at in math and you know, move, or in, in a subject and move some of them that are slower, even though they're in fourth grade. If they're in third grade math, you kind of move them without making them feel bad. You can move the fourth graders who are in fifth or sixth grade math up in a different class. I mean, I think there are other ways. This might be the easiest way, it might be the cheapest way, 
but I'm not sure it's the best way. And I think it might be a, a real problem. I think it might be uh, a so harmful way, the way the things are flowing. Just a point of clarification, competency-based education is not synonymous with computer-based. Sometimes technology is utilized and sometimes the programs do, but the systems, the school districts that are doing it, they've really built holistic systems. It's not, kids might not even be using computers at all, or if they are, they're using it to solve problems or to do the work. So it is, it is not competency-based means computer-based. Um, it's uh, good competency-based education programs blend how they are, are using the tools to move kids forward at different paces. So just to clarify, there's not a direct, it, they don't have to go together. Um, there are, I'm sure there's programs out there who market themselves as competency-based and they really are just a computer-based curriculum. That's not necessarily I think that, that might be the intention now, right. but I think the easy flow is going to be to move away from that and more towards the computer. Uh, when I attended breakout sessions at the governor's education gathering, one was on personalized learning, and it was all computer. It was all putting them in front of a computer and, you know, having them check boxes. So I, while there are always good intentions at the beginning, I see the flow of things moving towards what's cheaper and easier, and I just uh, have a concern about that. And if I can piggyback on that, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, we know that the number one factor in student success in the classroom is the quality of the instruction provided by the teacher. And we will remember to keep that in our forefront to um, ensure that putting kids in front of computers and having them progress through their learning through computers um, is, does not become a replacement for high quality instruction that the student receives. The reinforcement of that instruction certainly can occur through the use of technology. That's a tool to support learning, but the learning should occur through the interaction that the teacher has with the students in the classroom. So thank you for bringing that forward, and we'll keep that in mind. Yeah, I know, I know that even in some of the uh, high-tech areas in, uh, in California, the CEOs and all them, they send their kids to schools that don't even have computers. They're not allowed to have computers. I mean, there's a real pushback. There's some looking more at the one-room school. I mean, there's just a lot of... I just want to make sure that we're not just flowing in one direction, that we're open to many different ways, uh, whatever is best for the child. And then the other item that I did uh, want to bring up was data, and I saw that on page 22. I just have always been concerned and will continue to talk about the amount of data that we're collecting on kids, the, how it's being used, um, whether it's secure, uh, whether parents know uh, and are told exactly what kind of data is being collected on their children. Um, I think that that's... Uh, will some, be something that I'm uh, wanting to watch very closely. And I would just remind you that one of the biggest things about top 10 and 10 is creating multiple pathways. It isn't about creating a single pathway, it's about creating multiple pathway, pathways that students uh, and parents can choose from. And so that's what we, you know, that's really the premise of top 10 and 10, is creating those multiple pathways. Pathways to a, a job? Nope. Pathways uh, if, could be if you know what you want to be. If you know you want to be a plumber, great. If you know you want to be a teacher or a CPA or a policeman, great. That makes sense. If you don't know what you want to do, then that's a different pathway. I mean, in education, I do think that there are some broad things that you want all kids to understand. Absolutely. Problem not, solving. And not kind of uh, isolate into different pathways where they don't get certain, they don't get what, what uh, certain things that the other kids do in a general education environment. Okay, Michelle, please. Hi. Um, uh, so I I um, I really appreciate the report as well. Um, I like the the you know try the holistic approach, not just looking at um, high stakes testing, trying to look at other measures, and really um, pulling a lot of different ideas together to to um, look at measure schools and success and. Um, and uh, provide supports. Um, so, and I, I, I don't, not to be the dead horse, but the, I, I would like to, to say one thing. I, when I hear any time, any place, any um, whatever, any pace, I think of the EAA, and um, I think that that's, uh, so that, that always just, because that was their mantra, the mantra of that, and, uh, and I think the intentions were good, but I think, again, it, it, it shifted to, um, 
it was all about computers. It was all about having teachers be facilitators. Um, it was, some people would say, it was about some opportunities for some people to make a profit. Um, and I think we, as I think we all agree that that's not the way to do it, um, and that we need. To, and, and I've also seen um, friends of mine that have taken their kids to schools like Waldorf or these more, and they look at other ways of measuring competency besides test taking where kids can write a report and do a project, because if they're not good at test taking, how do they demonstrate that they understand? And so I think um, if it's done right, but I think there are forces out there that will push to computers, and I don't necessarily think it's cheaper. I think there are, um, you know, there are just, there's an, I'm always leery because I think there's an <laughs> incentives for a select few to make a profit off of this and to push it, and I think that's part of the forces we have to push back against. Um, so, but I, I like the idea, I would consider the idea of looking at competency if it was done right and done in a, in a, um, in a not just in a checking boxes and quick and dirty and more tests. <laughs> so, um, uh, but there was a, there was three things I wanted to bring up besides, and, um, one was, you know, there was a report recently about the NAEP scores of special ed students and that we weren't doing very well. And I don't really understand why we didn't do well compared to other states. Um, but I would like to understand why and like to see that incorporated in the sections around special education to address those concerns. Um, and uh, I, I would be curious if anybody knows why or if there, there's any sort of understanding as to why we scored so much lower than other states on the NAEP scores. Yeah, Terry wrote a response to that, and we'll put it in board briefs. Okay, okay. And, and if there was some way to um, expand on what's here on page 7, it seems <coughs> to me a bit limited um, in, in addressing our uh, special education. Um, I've been working on a task force in Detroit, um, looking at special ed in the city. And, um, and learning a lot about some of the concerns, mostly related to funding, but, but the funding has a direct impact on the services. Um, and there's just uh, a lot of, I, we're generating ideas for improving that, and I, I, I mean, I'd be happy to, maybe, you know, the people are aware of this, but I would be happy to work or to help provide the information we're generating at the, at that, on that task force, there's a lot of um, really, uh, you know, there's uh, you know, people from universities and experts in the field that are being gathered to discuss it. And I'd be happy to share that to um, coordinate uh, those efforts. Maybe. Um, then, uh, I yesterday I went to. Um, I was asked to come to a child care provider that gets the subsidy. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, from the state for, for child, so I was. I want to learn more about the early education piece and how that's working. And um, they asked me to come out, and so I came out, took a tour, met with the director, um, assistant director, um, and there, there was. They had all. They had a number of issues and concerns uh, with access, um, and uh, I mean, and I think it's all things that you all we all agree and are aware of that the um, funding, they, they have a, a hard time, you know, most of the workers, they can't afford to pay them $9 an hour. They make less than $9 an hour. And they don't have health benefits. And the turnover is through the roof. And then the, the reimbursements that they get from the state, even though they're, you know, have several stars, uh, doesn't meet their, the charges that they need to make ends meet. So um, uh, they're having, a lot of, so it affects their ability to provide services and provide access, and they work in a fairly high poverty area. So um, I'm not, so when we t talk about uh, the, the access, I think we really need to uh, <coughs> try to figure out a way to make sure, and everybody seems to agree across the, you know, across the aisle that early education is important, um, but there are real issues with, um, the, if it's so important, we shouldn't be paying people $9 an hour without benefits to deliver that service. Uh, 
Um, and I think that's a real concern. And I don't know if that's necessarily in the report. I didn't notice um, notice that, but I think that's an issue that needs to be addressed. And finally, um, on the <coughs> the testing bless you. for bless you. Bless you. Um, when he talks about recruit getting higher quality teachers, or you know, and relying on cuts and raising cut scores on the uh, on that, I, I I think the idea of having um, competency based learning should apply to that as well. So if it's if a if a person's going to be a teacher and is going to teach, especially if they're going to teach in a competency based way in this holistic way but then we're expecting them to be, just narrow them to the SAT and this cut score. Um, and um, what I think I read in the report, we're gonna hear later, that uh, something like only a third pass the test, and they have to take the test multiple times, and I think the test, the price is tripled, quadrupled of that test, right? So um, teachers were having a hard time recruiting teachers, um, we're relying on tests that they have to take multiple times that have escalated in price. Um, it seems perhaps there should be a waiver for for people on those tests that are, um, especially if they're you know, from willing to work in a high poverty district or I don't know some some way to <laughs> to look at um, people who are would be great teachers but not necessarily. Um, you know, the best test takers. So um, it, it seems sort of, uh, you know, contradictory to me that we want to, you know, have these other ways of, of measuring um, success. And, uh, and, and, and I think, I, and I was, again, reading in the report from Michigan Futures that the SAT and the ACT are not very reliable predictors of college completion or college um, persistence. It, GPA is much better measure for that. So um, perhaps we should consider when we're trying to recruit teachers being a little bit more creative um, on that end and also being a little more accommodating with the costs of taking this test. <coughs> Nikki and then Richard. Pam, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand okay. up. So it's just this, a huge, it's huge. So I'm going to, I don't want to do it soon, and I'm just going to, I'm asked, so in terms of what you're doing with the annual review, do we just refer to this throughout the year as we talk about any given topic or number within the strategic plan? We, we can. The purpose of the annual review is to, showcase the work that was done the previous year and then what we do in this year is we use the initiatives and the efforts that we started this past year as as we move it provides direction for moving forward um so i'll just kind of make some of my comments and kind of ask along the way since we'll dig in deeper each time but um i am too you know i echo most of everyone's sentiment but i am concerned as we talk about teaching as a profession one of the feelings I have is that relationship is so important that we're teaching our kids relationship. They understand it. We're in relationship with, with each other. That's how we serve one another um, from any role or capacity. But um, we talk about distance learning, online learning. I think that is something we need to dig into because you're removing the relationship from it. And um, that's a big concern of mine. So that's probably something I'll probably refer to along the lines um, each ish initiative we talk about from the perspective of financial impact on the family on the student I probably ask some questions on digging into what's the financial impact from the state legislature the MDE perspective how does that impact the family the students um, as they pick a path if they will or don't pick a path um, financial impact is a big thing for families and students long term so, um, and then spectrum, people have talked about spectrum of learners. Um, you talked about students with disabilities. There's a couple of, sorry, there's a couple of data points that I just want to explore through our, our conversations. You know, whether it's mathematics or ELA, you see a huge drop in proficiency from third grade to 11th. 
Um, in language arts, you see a, about 5%, and now you see a significant drop. What is that? What, what do we count that to, and how should we address that? Um, and it really doesn't match the growth, so how are we tracking the growth for deficiency for students with disabilities? And I think that we can tackle understanding the numbers better, but understand what we can do to increase that gap because the numbers are really um, not just the need for these numbers. I do feel like I understand that you, you talk about that perspective, the end of that spectrum, the other end of the spectrum. There are students that are ready to move forward. They're ready to move forward at a different pace than everyone else. And I think that's fine. I think we need to be explaining what that looks like. So the, the discussion is a good thing. Um, Anyhow, there's, there's a lot to it, so I'll just keep referring back to what you okay. spent a lot of time doing, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pam, please. So I guess my question is one that I, you know, circle back to quite a bit, and I'm looking on page um, 30 in the, the chart of the subgroups. And um, it's a question that I continuously ask. I'm looking through the review and doing some comparisons. I guess, where are we with our African American children? And, and I'm just surprised that it's not here. I'm kind of embarrassed because this is, and let me back up, this is a wonderful document. Um, I think it's, it's very clear, it is easy to read, it lets us know where we are and where, where, where we're going. Um, so I definitely want to uh, mention that. But I definitely think that it um, is indicative of what our priorities are. And I'm just surprised that African-American children are not in this, this subgroup here, being that they're one of the lower performing. And I'm going through the review chart um, to see. But I, as I pull out African-American children, I'm still seeing where they're still falling um, short. Um, in the proficiency across the various indicators. So I'm just really surprised that that's not there. We, we can add it to there on the online one, and it certainly is in the appendix. It's in the appendix, appendix and, but and, we can add it to that. I'll answer why we didn't include any of the um, race ethnicity just for formatting for um, the space that that's we had on the page. That's not a good excuse. It's so, that I continue to raise. So. And it's not, we would list all of them then. Well, we, I, we can do that. We'll add it to the online, we'll and like I said, it is in the appendix. So we'll add it. I don't know at all. African Americans continue to fall short, and so that's my reason. If it, it, for me, if it were white, if it were any of the other ethnicities that I was seeing the data um, that I'm seeing here, I would pull that out. If we're talking about raising our coming, raising our scores, then typically. You start with those who are at the bottom um, and those that we need to do the most work with. And I think that the groups that you pulled out for the subgroups down here um, that are showing up on page 30, I think that they should be there. I just think that um, when you look at a lot of the data, you will see that African Americans are falling shorter than, than some of these other subgroups. That's why I say African Americans. I agree, but I also wouldn't want it to be only the black population included that it would be interpreted as singling out a subgroup. Yeah, well, English learners is singular. That's right. We'll address it, we'll and address it is it. in the appendix. So. What else you got, Pam? I think that's good. I, I did all many of the other comments. Okay. So we can address that. And then Richard, please. Yeah. Okay. Well, the good news on page 29 is that 98% of our teachers are effective. And as you said, the most important factor for a student's um, performance is an effective teacher. Um, now, if we had scored 98% on, on a NAEP test or something like that, we'd be crowing and telling everyone. Um, the fact that we're not really celebrating this is a sign that the department itself doesn't regard this as a particularly trustworthy measure. Um, it's an interesting contrast. 98% of our teachers are effective, and yet the next topic is equity and whether kids in uh, economically depressed districts have the same access to effective teachers. What are we doing to get a more realistic, uh, um, 
or credible measure of teacher effectiveness going forward? Well, I think we all agree that the 98% effective teachers doesn't line up with the data in terms of performance. And that's why we're doing a lot of work in terms of working with districts on how to appropriately uh, implement uh, teacher evaluation programs. We talked about there's 95, uh, or we have staff that works with uh, ISDs and local districts on trying to improve their evaluation and more work is to come because I think these are the numbers as they're currently reported, but I think I would challenge that those don't line up with the performance and so we've got an issue there that needs to be addressed. It, and if I may add, it would be interesting to see uh, data um, at some point comparing uh, the self evaluation or district evaluation, uh, the source of these evaluations, uh, the performance data, and uh, measure that against uh, the traditional view of um, uh, tenure uh, or just years of service. The, the old assumption was that the longer you'd been teaching, the more effective you were. It would be interesting to see how that lines up with the self-evaluation and with the other measures of effectiveness that we have. We can see if we can get that. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, Michelle, please. Um, the study that talks about the most influential factor, the OECD study, um, had uh, economic status as being a far greater influence on these test scores. Um, so, which is what teachers are generally evaluated on. Um, and also, we have laws that say if they're rated ineffective, what, two years in a row, they're going to be fired. So that is bad policy in my book, which is going to create an incentive <laughs> to, um, and there's a teacher shortage uh, in many areas. Um, so I think given those factors, um, you know, uh, it, it's not surprising that this is the result um, because people are, it's, it's, it's just too high stakes and it's also, there's a 50% turnover uh, or more of teachers in the first five years. So there's a lot of weeding out of teachers in the first five years, um, self-weeding out um, as they leave the profession for whatever reason. So. Um, I, I wouldn't want to, I think focusing on this um, effective, ineffective teachers as being the be all end all is a big mistake because there are factors that influence the outcome on test scores that are well beyond the teacher's uh, ability to deal with. So. Pam, please. One of the questions that I have, and maybe we might have mentioned this as we're talking about uh, teachers, educators, is that we have students that will show up this fall that may not have educators at all. Uh, we know in the past we've had kids who have been herded into gymnasiums and waiting for the, a teacher to show up. So how is that uh, reflected in here? Um, and, 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 is, is that and it isn't right now. Um, but certainly we can provide that information. Okay. Well, and as Sheila said, the report uh, reflects work we've done in the last year. So I think your question is work going forward. So how are we, get, how are we gearing up to help um, our partnership districts be ready to address their shortages and their workforce issues? And so we've begun work with those districts, for example, knowing that we, they need to get bodies in good, ready <laughs> people in classrooms to teach kids. And that that's a unique challenge, particularly in districts that have a lot of challenges. So, and, and that's another reason why I think having African American children, I think, in a lot of these districts, you will see that that may be an issue versus it just being an economically disadvantaged mm -hmm. um, district. But I think that measure that is helped to measure the impact of that as well. Thank you, Pam. All right, we are going to move on. The next item on the committee of the whole agenda is presentation on K3 components of quality for classroom environments. The document covers the context and environment in which children learn. The purpose is to one, create a shared vocabulary supporting K3 quality, and two, foster conversations among okay. administrators, teachers, and parents about policies and practices that promote high quality classroom environments. 
The next step is following a period of public comment, the board will be asked to consider approval at its October 10th meeting. The presenters today are Richard Lauer, Director of Preschool and Out of School Time Learning, Emily Hook, Research uh, to Practice Consulting, and Nancy Sherbrooke, Clinton County RESA Office of Innovative Projects. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, board members. Um, Emily Hulk is on the end here. Nancy Serbrook and myself. Good morning. morning. So, the purpose uh, that we embarked on this process over the last 18 months or so was really to establish a document uh, that provides the field with some level of guidance um, and framework for understanding uh, the non-academic aspects of a learning environment that contribute to um, outcomes both academic and non-academic and what those components uh, and competencies are of a high quality education in an early elementary setting. Um, it's really based on over two decades worth of research that, and evidence supporting best practices in the early elementary years. Uh, the work here is to help uh, early elementary field better understand the critical components um, of successful learning for kindergartners, first and second, third graders, uh, and to support implementation of policies and practices in those settings to promote high quality classroom environments. Um, this was really uh, started at the request of the field. In particular, where, um, I, every summer into fall, I receive uh, calls from kindergarten teachers in particular who are asking for some direction, some uh, context from the department in understanding and helping to educate their uh, elementary building uh, peers as well as their administrators on what does a good context of an early elementary uh, classroom look like. And so this is uh, several years in the making, but uh, you know it's at the request of the field that we started this work. Um, and there is some history as well for leadership that the board has had over the decades. Why is this important? Um, it's been actually said several times in the prior conversation about positive relationships um, and quality learning experiences are essential for student success, uh, both academically and non-academically in all areas of development. And that experiencing a quality education is vital to the future of their success, not only short term in the elementary years, but long term through high school graduation and beyond. And the learning environment is one of those pieces that does not get enough uh, attention, the context in which a child learns um, from my point of view. And so this is meant to uh, fill that gap of understanding and information. Um, it absolutely aligns with the uh, state's top 10 and 10 strategic goals, um, in particular strategy 1.4, ensuring that the 2 point system has aligned expectations and outcomes that transition Michigan's children between the various stages of their education and development. And uh, the work is important to promote the lifelong learning and success of the children. So I'm going to turn it over at this point um, to Nancy. Uh, these were our partners that I brought on with Lean Resources. We've achieved a lot um, <laughs> uh, through uh, consultation with partners in the field as well as being able to facilitate a larger stakeholder group. Good morning, anyone, everyone. Um, the first question to ask, is there anything like this in place already? And in short, the answer is no. Um, there is a document that is I have with me, a 1992 document that um, looked at pre-kindergarten through second grade. This would be the, doc the only document, really, that was in place. Because about 10 years after this was published, um, the State Board received a report from the task force uh, on ensuring early childhood literacy that uh, recommended something be provided that would focus on children ages three and four. So that report was approved and accepted and so as part of that report um, they put together a commission that would create uh, early childhood standards of quality which is um, this document and actually one was um, brought before you in 2005 and then a revised version which is this one was brought in 2013 really focusing on the pre-kindergarten years, um, but not the, kin the kindergarten through third grade years. In 2013, 
Um, the Office of Great Start had intended to reestablish the work uh, for K3 with some ARA funding. Um, however, it wasn't completed. There was a draft done, but the work in and of itself wasn't completed. So therefore, Michigan doesn't have anything, and there isn't a lot in any other states either. We had noticed as we were looking through um, different, as we were doing our research, there wasn't a lot available for early elementary staff um, that was comprehensive related to the learning environments. So what are the, the K-3 components of quality? And um, I, I believe you all have the document that you have a chance to look through, I'm hoping, anyway. That, that is what you said. Um, this document is a resource document. It is for elementary administrators and teachers to promote policies and practices that are developmentally appropriate. Um, it does represent the most up-to-date viewpoints in research um, of the experts in the field at this time. And the creators of this document really spent a lot of time and were committed to making sure that we use solid research and evidence-based in writing the document. So we wanted to make sure we had the most up-to-date um, uh, available information out there in this particular document. So we had a large group of stakeholders represented in this process over the last year and a half or so. They included a number of teachers, um, administrators. We had representatives from advocacy organizations, professional development entities, researchers, university personnel, and a number of colleagues here from the Department of Education representing different offices. We had a national expert panel that we used as reviewers after we completed our initial draft. They included colleagues from the Education Commission on the States, several universities that we contacted, colleagues from the New Jersey Office of um, Educational and the National Association for the Education of Young Children, excuse me, the New Jersey Department of Education, they were very helpful, and also uh, researchers at the University of Washington. And so t to go through our timeline, we started in November 2015 with our um, state stakeholder group. We brought them all together. We looked at the draft that was created, that was um, done at the end of 2013 and divided up into sections and in small groups looking at that particular draft. And the idea was that we would um, review the draft and edit it and bring it up to date and then bring it here. Uh, in the two months between the first meeting and our second meeting in January, it was realized that we probably wanted to do a little bit more than just review, and we wanted to look at the document's construction. We wanted to make sure that relevant, um, up-to-date research was involved. So in that particular process, um, we decided to reorganize how we had started the, the project and pulled together a smaller group we called them um, a developer or writing group to really focus on the overall document. It was large enough that looking at it in pieces wasn't making sense to everyone. They would ask questions like, um, is, is that covered someplace else? Does it need to be covered here? Um, or I think that really should go here and not someplace else. And so it was really challenging to be able to do all those pieces. So we established a smaller group of writers <coughs> which consisted of teachers, administrators, researchers, and MDE personnel. And this smaller group spent um, about one day a month through March to December. And when I say a day, I mean about two hours, anywhere from two hours to a full day, looking at the document, um, discussing the components, um, looking at research, cross-referencing between the NYUC, which is the National Association for the Education of Young Children, and the Division for Early Childhood, and other national documents that talk about best practice, and seeing where is that in our document, and can we cite those particular pieces? And once we came down to a product that um, we felt was comprehensive enough but not duplicative, we um, forwarded it on to the, the, the uh, review groups that we had established. So in, de in um, December 2016 through January 2017, we sent it out to our national experts to review and to give feedback on the draft and we received their feedback back and um, <coughs> took their feedback and the draft and brought the full stakeholder group together. The reviewers and the developers were together so the developers could walk through the process and how they came to where they did and the reviewers had time to look at everything that had been done and provide comment on it. And then we took all of the comments back and in May 2017 the reviewer group went through all of the comments and made changes 
um, based on all of those comments. We sent this draft out to the um, stakeholders within our state again and asked for further feedback. And then the version you have here is the latest version based on all of that feedback. So like I said, this product is a resource document to encourage and support policy and practices for implementation that um, is high quality for all elementary classrooms and buildings across our state. It's a very solid product, and it represents the best thinking of everyone in the group and the research in the field at the time. And some guidelines that we developed and um, had the develop or had the writer group follow really um, were to, to look at the whole child or student, not to write for special populations, to make sure that we're being taking a holistic approach to um, the classroom environment when we're educating children in kindergarten through third grade. We also wanted to avoid jargon and specific models and intervention. If we were to include specific models or interventions in this particular document, our concern was it would be dated. Um, you, would be, you would see something that maybe is very up to date and very current now that's the, the latest flavor of the month to use something that has already been said here today. And um, that particular flavor may be gone in three years from now. And we really want this document to stand the test of time at least longer than that. Um, so we wanted to avoid that. We wanted to highlight expectations and describe the elements that were necessary to, to for the understanding. Um, elements in this case are, are the, the, indi the indicators. The indicators are used as examples, not necessarily as a checklist. And just as we encourage teachers to integrate things into their curriculum, we have worked to overlap this guidance with uh, existing guidance and materials that are already available. And this was one thing that I know the um, developer group struggled with quite a bit. They wanted to make sure that anything that was in here related to curriculum, teaching practices, student assessment, wasn't in another document, but was specifically related to the environment of the classroom. So that was something that was spent a lot of time on um, and discussion over a couple different meetings. We wanted to make sure that the um, illustrative examples are, um, that the illustration of the examples um, are really indicators and not used as a checklist. I know I mentioned that once, but um, I think it's important to reiterate because I know the teachers in the field do ask for checklists. How can I, you know, what checklist can I use to make sure my environment is, is high quality? And we didn't write the indicators to be that. We wanted to them to be used as ex examples. And then we also made sure that all, everything that, that is in there is based in research and best practice. And Appendix B has a detailed reference list to the work that we used. So <coughs> what are the components of quality? There are 26 individual components of quality based around these nine domains that are listed. And they represent the critical areas for quality of a classroom environment. Uh, one, mission, vision, beliefs, and guiding principles. Two, uh, community collaboration. Three, family engagement. Four, transitioning to kindergarten. Five, learning environments. Six, teaching practices. Seven, qualifications and professional development. Eight, curriculum. And nine, student assessment and intervention. Oh. Just want to make one note here. Um, the only one, the only indicator, or not, I'm sorry, the only component that we didn't have consensus on was under number four, transitioning to kindergarten. And this is regarding the age entry into kindergarten on page 17. Um, and if there are questions about that, we can address that after the presentation. But we did um, leave it the way it, it was and uh, wanted to get public comment on it. So the example of a component uh, in family engagement, component C, the component itself says that K3 leadership and staff provide a range of authentic, developmentally appropriate, in and out of school parent engagement opportunities. In this particular competency, authentic means genuine, that parents engage genuinely and are interested in what's going on in school and um, continue that, that particular learning outside with things that are relative, relevant to their daily life. So the indicators 
that, that we use as examples to that is uh, home, home learning opportunities are encouraged as an extension of the school day as opposed to the expectation that parents help to reteach the daily lesson plan or complete unfinished daily work. Really our hope is that teachers can um, give, thing, give parents things to do that really are rooted in, in what parents are already doing that extend the learning so that there's learning happening in school and learning happening at home and that those two are relevant and useful for kids. The second one, research about effective collaboration and family engagement is continually reviewed and families are provided effective learning opportunities at home that align with the research. And the third one, respect and acknowledgement is given for the need to balance family time and school related activities, particularly as it relates to homework and family learning opportunities. So that um, family time is respected and that we're actually encouraging families to do things together and not spend the whole night doing worksheets and different things like that because that um, we have it doesn't foster learning as well as spending time together so our next steps um, today we're here presenting this to all of you and we'll put it out for public comment um, we'll accept public comment uh, from the day it goes out this afternoon or tomorrow whenever that is and then through till September 13th 2017 uh, we will compile and evaluate all of the comments and make changes as needed. You will see us back here again October 10th, 2017 for another review and then we will ask for approval um, of the revised document based on public comment. So Thank you. That, any questions? Dr. Ziegler? Dom? Dr. Ziegler. All right. On uh, page 17 of the document, <coughs> Let's see, competency K-3 leadership staff guarantee entrance into kindergarten solely by meeting the state defined kindergarten entry age eligibility requirements without exception. Uh, indicator one, the students not excluded from school or placed in extra year programs such as developmental kindergarten, beginning beginner garden, or young fives based on age, gender, culture, ethnicity, economic factors, special needs, home language, Participation in early childhood programs, delayed or cognitive development, delayed gross or fine motor skills, <coughs> or delayed social and emotional development. Where does this come from? So this is a ongoing debate for several decades around the issue of uh, redshirting children prior to kindergarten entry um, based on uh, descriptors or characteristics of children rather than their actual abilities and skill set and um, it complements with the current work on the multi-tiered systems um, work where we differentiate learning based on where the child or student is and and, and taking them from uh, and giving them additional uh, supports within a particular domain rather than holding the child back a full grade uh, uh, prior to even the first year of kindergarten. And so um, this was the, the item that Nancy mentioned was the point of disagreement in the stakeholder group um, related to developmental kindergarten versus kindergarten. And this has been an ongoing piece since the, um, for decades as I said, but it really started with um, getting some uh, attention when Prop A was developed when there was no distinction between developmental kindergarten and kindergarten from a fiscal or policy point of view. And then in 2012, the legislature um, worked along to differentiate the fiscal aspect of it to say that um, half-day kindergartens or developmental kindergartens were getting funded at the same uh, full per pupil allowance as kindergarten and that needed to be shored up to a percentage prorated basis um, that you need to go for a full day in order to get a full foundation allowance. So from a fiscal point of view, there's been some work and some advancement on a policy point of view. The debate continues on whether or not uh, it is a good practice to, uh, for children in particular who have fall birth dates from September 2nd through December 1st under the current law uh, to put them into developmental kindergarten for a year as a planned two-year 
sequence of kindergarten before they go on to first grade? Or should the children be uh, uh, put in with their age cohort into kindergarten, decide whether or not have them go through, have them get an appropriate uh, tiered approach to intervention um, based on their performance, and then truly if they are not ready for kindergarten, then they can repeat as a true retention of kindergarten. This is a topic um, that Governor Snyder actually um, raised in his 2013 State of the State, I believe it was, when he announced that over 14,000 kindergartens would be retained every year. And we've worked with, the, with CEPI to at least uh, disaggregate the data at kindergarten to show what is the true retention of children who've gone through kindergarten in the year immediate prior to, kinder, uh, to first grade and need to repeat versus those who are in a planned two-year sequence, which is developmental kindergarten or whatever name plus kindergarten. And it breaks out that 14,000 into about 12,500 are planned two-year sequence. The rest are the true retention, which is um, on par with every other grade in the elementary years. Um, it just, it's a misrepresentation somewhat if you put them all together aggregate-wise. Okay. So what the reason why we wanted to leave this language in there is to see what the broader community really thinks uh, of this topic because we have a debate going on um, in the field around this between early childhood and K-12. Well, and the other pieces, there's a couple different um, research articles that we found that show that there is no evidence that kids do better over the long haul in having two years of kindergarten. And those reference articles um, on page 36, the Hanover research article and then the one right underneath it, both speak to kindergarten, kindergarten readiness and the start age. And that the research is saying that there isn't a lot, there isn't, um, let's see, we find no evidence that a policy of great retention in kindergarten approves average achievement in math or reading. So um, that was another reason why we left it in there so we could have the, the open conversation about it. All right, Tom, please. Then, um, oh, I, sorry, oh, sorry, Dr. Z. May I just observe that that research would be of a piece with other research that shows that um, Head Start has no lasting effects. So, I guess ideologically we have to decide which which uh, which implications are we going to use as as the basis for policy. This this does seem to me to be the sort of thing that. Um, perhaps could be left to local districts or programs as to how they want to structure. Um, but candidly, I, I redshirted uh, three out of four of my kids and regret I didn't do it with the fourth. Um, and um, there's just a lot of advantages to being older and having an extra 20% of language development and physically larger and, and so on and so forth. So um, I, I think that if it is an area of controversy, perhaps it could be left to local districts. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Z. Tom, please. Um, thank you. I was looking at the, the folks that uh, were on this um, group that that uh, prepared this, and I didn't, there were a couple retired teachers. I didn't see, uh, was that the, there were two te two former teachers? Is that is the extent of te the number of teachers that were involved? Yeah. It, um, an administrator and teacher from the DeWitt Public Schools who joined us. Um, the idea behind having the retired teachers is that the meetings initially were going to take place during the school day, during the school year. And as the process extended itself, we added Beth Whaley from DeWitt Public Schools, who's teacher administrator. Okay, I mean, I just, um, I would prefer to hear uh, more about how the rubber meets the road and how, you know, teachers uh, view these kind of things. I. I was in a meeting with a couple of my uh, colleagues, and we heard from kindergarten teachers and, and uh, early uh, childhood teachers, and they just said that they really don't have the ability to teach. They are just checking boxes about making sure that all the granular items that they have to get to because of a high stakes test coming up or whatever. And, um, you know, they, I, I think they would have had a lot of pushback in what is a quality classroom environment. So I'd like to. Um make one more if I can correct myself Michelle Berg was on the committee she is an administrator and I believe also a teacher has been a teacher in the k2 environment 
and <clears throat> through both Mickey Berg and also through um, Brandy ne Mendham mm -hmm. from Zealand Public Schools, we were able to push down to a number of their teachers and get feedback. Brandy was part. <coughs> Brandy and Michelle were both part of the developers group. So every time we did an area of development, they went back and talked to some of their administrators. But I think we agree with you. Even talking to some of the retired teachers, um, we'd like more feedback from the field about some well, of the We can make sure that happens during the how, public how can, comment. Well, that during was one of my, how can you make sure that particularly K-3 teachers are, you know, really looking at this? I mean, that we're gonna, are, are we gonna aggressively try to seek their feedback? And how would we do that? How is that gonna be done? The advocacy associations that have been a part of the work all along have committed to highlighting it as it goes out for public comment. A number of them have already worked with us and did provide us comments when we went out for the comment period in May of this year. So that is part of what we were trying to do. We put it out through our networks. It'll be on the website. I'll also make sure MEA and AFT get it and encourage yes. them to have their teachers, early childhood teachers, look at it. I mean, is this, uh, is this the kind of thing that... Um, you know, are all K-3 classrooms the same throughout the dis throughout the state? I mean, are there, you know, I went to one of the failing schools that, or one of the quote unquote failing that the state says is failing. I'm not sure that they were at all. Um, and you know, their second graders are walking a mile to school in the dark, you know, in Detroit. Uh, you know, I don't know what kind of, I don't know what that would be like to have those children that, that are having to deal with that kind of or who knows what else is being dealt with, you know, I just would imagine that it's, it's difficult to try to, to broad, you know, to, to say that all the, all kindergarten through three classrooms are going to look like this. I just, that's just a separate, um, how much intervention, how much unstructured, does this get into unstructured play and mm -hmm. things like that? I mean, uh, you know, I know that that's important. I also, uh, have seen presentations about interventions with kindergartners and pulling them out and you know I just wonder about how far we get to this whole uh, pressure uh, on children uh, and whether they're failing I've seen kindergartners crying because they've been told they're failing in reading or failing somewhere uh, you know I mean how do we and, and I know people like Diane Ravitch and others and this is a you know a, a topic that I know has some differences but uh, like Diane says, the Common Core and what it expects from young kids is very developmentally inappropriate. And other, I've heard child psychiatrists, uh, psychologists say the same thing. Um, you know, feedback when you're in first grade, you may not be able to take negative feedback very well from your, you know, and if that's something that's being encouraged, that may be problematic for children. Um, so I just, uh, you know, I wonder about unstructured play. I wonder about inter intervention, these type of interventions for children or kindergartners, first graders. And also um, just the process. I'm kind of learning here the process. Uh, we got a topic coming up in a little bit and I might have pushback and maybe that wasn't the time for pushback is when it comes back in October. Is the pushback now? Do we as a board supposed to change and have an impact on what goes out for comments? And if we don't, then when it comes back to us, if there's a lot, if we have substantive issues, we haven't heard from the public on those things and we just change it. And do you send it back out if it's, a, if it's substantial changes? Um, I guess I'm a little, uh, so there's a lot there that I ask you can feel free to pick whatever you want there, but. Um, I think if there's things that you want, wish us to change, you should let us know that now before we go out for public comment. And then hold it up and not go out right now? Well, we'd go out once you gave us your feedback, yes. Eileen, please. Um, more on what Tom just said. I think that um, uh, the, the role of the State Board of Ed, which is to find, help find the sweet spot between professional direction uh, based on research um, and uh, knowledge of the state, um, but then having that presented, right now we, you come to us, I, and this is all presentations, not you, I'm not singling you out, but, <laughs> but we get great presentations, it goes out to, for public comment, and then we get a document back on which we can't tell what's been changed. And uh, I think that what I've been hearing a little bit is where's the public comment, is there a way to find out what the public comment was, the tone of it, so that we're not feeling ambushed the second time you present it by changes that we can't discern and people still feeling unsettled in the field. 
I, I'd say that in the last, I've been on this board now for an additional six years, and the difference between the first time and this time, in the last two or three years, where voters are able to access information, which we want them to do, but they're because of the internet, they're researching in ways that they're, they're directing themselves to uh, sites that have nothing to do with how you put this together, and they have anxieties that we hear about and we can't resolve. So I would ask if there's a way to either do three presentations, one initially, and then another one on what changes are being contemplated, and then a vote the following month, or giving us public comment, a summary of it, as you rewrite the document so that we can see the tone and we understand what the proposals are. I don't sure. want to slow down the work good. of the department, but there is this political filter, and we are statewide elected, and that's our voice and our role. Sure. Makes sense. So um, we will be collecting public comment through a survey um, function, Survey Monkey is what we utilize. And so we will be able to download every, and we have an unlimited text for them to be able to put their comments in. And um, we have a way to download the data so that it gives the full representation of every comment. It can be done anonymously or it can be done with uh, identification. That's a, a variable. Uh, based on the commenter and um, that entire document can be provided um, to you with all the comments uh, pros and cons uh, that come from the field and then um, the document as it's getting um, reflected upon based on the comment that can be done in a variety of ways one it can be done in track changes to showcase rather than a summary of general themes it can be done very specifically at that granular level to show you exactly where in the document there were changes based on public comment versus more of the narrative, because I've seen both kinds over the years as well. And so um, I'm more than willing to provide that level um, as we move through this process. All right, Cassandra, please, then Michelle. What is the date that this is out for public comment? We were going to release it uh, this week as of Thursday's MD communication. Um, and then it ends when? September 13th. Okay. So given the fact that we're in summer break right now, or mm -hmm. most teachers are, um, what is the likelihood that we'll get a lot of teacher responses at this particular time frame? This is where we believe that late August, first two weeks of September, <coughs> um, absolutely are the transition period back into the school. And this would be fresh. To, uh, at the top of the list, you know, at the top of the awareness for the teacher teaching population and uh, elementary administrators to be able to see. Um, and so that's why we chose that time frame. We can amend it to go later if we are going to um, get guidance to amend and push into a three-phase um, uh, approach to this. Um, we can always move it later into September. Um, and then we wouldn't come in October, we may come in November or December with a final document. Michelle, please. Um, I'm just I'm wondering if there's use of um, uh, like a focus groups or even there's, uh, there's that teachers from across the state that's been, um, been brought mm -hmm. together. I wonder if there's some early ele elementary teachers that could be brought in as part of a charge to give some direct review from their point of view. Uh, and I assume that there's teachers that come from different areas of the state, so maybe they would, um, it would address some of the concerns Tom brought up with teachers from different areas that might have, um, you know, their community might be different, it might, they might need, uh, ha have different points of view on how, uh, you know, on how to improve it or what, what they foresee as concerns, um, so. I, I always find direct dialogue with people um, and focusing on the document uh, who are going to be involved in actually implementing that is really valuable information. So. I still have. Yes, Tom? Uh, actually, you know, my question about unstructured play and interventions in kindergarten really didn't get addressed. I'd like to hear that. And sure. just the unintended consequences of high stakes testing or even testing at a young age. And, you know, how is that, I mean, I think that really affects the quality of the classroom. And, you know, I mean, is there, was there a dissenting opinion? You said there was one, you know, were there, I guess I don't know 
Did everybody vote yay on this uh, that was on your little group? Or were there some that, you know, were quite troubled by some of the parts or that some were, things weren't added? The, the major issue was the development kindergarten, kindergarten issue that was a point of contention. Otherwise, we used the general consensus of the group um, and no one voiced any, um, anything beyond the kindergarten discussion. Uh, there was general consensus with no extreme objections to anything else that was put in the other areas. The unstructured play piece uh, where play-based learning, experience, adult-child interaction happens within component uh, which five. five, the learning environment. And it is uh, where we speak to the broad strokes of philosophy of how the environment should be uh, child-driven, student-driven in terms of their learning. It's not prescribed and scripted um, in, in that environment. And um, that's where we address the issue of uh, definitely having a minimum of at least one session that's 45 minutes for active, um, non-structured play and activities that aligns with the research and okay. uh, American Academy uh, of Pediatrics and okay. other national groups. Um, I guess the, you know, the, and it just occurred to me also that, you know, the retired teachers were fine and even the ones that had, but from what I'm hearing, from what our, at our meeting anyway, the fact that now uh, tenure has been changed and third grade reading is there, that, that things have changed, uh, and the uh, teacher evaluation process, uh, state top down, that things have changed dramatically in the last couple of years where retired teachers in K-3 or even those that have been there may not understand the, the weight of what's going on now. And I don't know if this is ready. I mean, I, I, would have, I would think that it would be better to have several current teachers that are under the, the I'm thinking of the ones that I heard from that said, I can't teach the way I want anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, and I think some of it is <coughs> perceived what the state, because of the third grade reading and, and holding them back and all that. Some of it's perceived, some of it's district imposed and not state imposed, and it's based on perceptions and I just, wonder if there's a, if this document needs to be more uh, cognizant of the current environment that has been placed on some of the K through three teachers in a way that uh, their ability to teach is dramatically changed. So we'll work with the team to make sure we're that we, were not, we won't go out for public <coughs> comment now. We will make sure we have a process in place to get teachers uh, to give input and then we'll bring it back to the board. Uh, so yeah, we'll do that. And then Tom, you know, testing's required by law. So none of us like, uh, well, I don't know about none. Most of us don't like testing in uh, the early grades, but it is required by law. So we'd love your help in getting that changed. Well, but I think that this is a document that might help make that change if we do it right. And that if it's, if it's acknowledged the detriment that it is going on with uh, policy changes in this document, that might be helpful. Um, to, uh, to making changes. And to answer your question about assessment, um, student assessment component is uh, discussed on page 26, and we do um, advocate uh, and promote a balanced assessment, which takes all information across all different areas and from the parents to see where the child is at. So it's not um, a test, it's within the realm of what the teachers are already doing. So just wanted to address that because I know you Thank had you. Asked I mean, this about is that. real important stuff. Like Young Zhao that I brought in in February, you know, I mean, this is it, how quickly do we kill creativity in kids? When I've gone to these quote unquote failing schools in their fir first grade classes, those kids are bouncing off the wall with all kind of creativity. They're just, I don't think they're any different than kids in Birmingham and everywhere else, but it's just how quickly the system that is, you know, kind of a cookie cutter, how, you know, and it, how quickly it kills their creativity. And I just, it's a, this is important stuff, that's all I'm saying. Uh, Nikki and then Shep, please. Can you have a physical copy of it? Is that possible? I'm sorry? She wants a physical copy. Can you, you print it off? you just have physical copies of it? We can print one. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Michelle, please. Yeah, and um, I was with Tom when we met with some of the, some of the early, um, teachers and a number of them were early education. One of them said there was a 68 point, um, obviously they have to observe, they have like 18 kids, 
EPA data points they have to record on each child twice a year. And, um, and uh, they asked if that could be consolidated to, because that, it, you know, because I think what happens is um, a lot of people have ideas of what they think should be measured, but then the practitioner, then it comes down to the practitioner and then it's sort of overwhelming. Um, so, and, and it gets to the point, so I, and maybe you're aware of that. It, it, and so there's, so, you know, talking, and again, I'm talking to more uh, early education providers, pre-K and K2, um, K3. Um, is, is there, um, and I know we, in the, in the top 10 and 10, they talk about having some feedback loops. So if in an ongoing way, even after there is something passed and things get implemented and there's some unintended consequences, um, how do those people, uh, and it, you know, is there a professional organization for these early child care providers? Is there some group that they can belong to to maybe voice in a you know com comprehensive way what some of their concerns are with some of this stuff? Because I, when I'm talking, you know, I know that you know there's the AFT and E and K three, but in the early ed, I, I'm wondering if there's a group that the department could be involved in forming a group to provide ongoing feedback of how these policies are actually hitting the ground and, um, and to, to tweak them, improve them, you know, based on that feedback. The current uh, group that covers birth through age eight, which includes the K-3, is the Michigan Association for the Education of Young Children. Okay. They're the statewide um, professional group uh, <coughs> that can represent across the the spectrum of early care and education um, providers, teachers as well, okay. um, and that could, in that group was part of this um, process. So people, I, well, I haven't talked to a huge group, but they weren't aware of any. So they're they're visible. And they have offices in Southeast Michigan as well. They're, they're a statewide organization housed in Lansing, but they have regional. Um, affiliates all throughout the state of Michigan. So there is one in Southeast Michigan as well. Yes, it would be the Southeast, Southeast, Southeast yeah. Michigan uh, Association for Education. Metro Detroit. Yeah, Metro Detroit, something like that. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So we'll work on the process to get some more teacher input and we'll bring it back. Okay. All right, so we are going to move uh, transparency dashboard to this afternoon because we're running extremely behind. And we have some people waiting for us. So item D is the next item on the community of the whole agenda. Discussion regarding criteria for grant programs. Yes. Okay. So criteria for project search grants. Um, first of all, is this federal money or state money? Is Louie in the room? Kyle? Kyle? It's, uh, it's federal money. It's federal. It's federal. It's federal. Title one's federal. Okay. Uh, is it earmarked specifically for this? particular program yes okay because that's interesting because I'm wondering if the US Department of Education talks to the IRS because the IRS has been kind of frowning on um, uncompensated labor and um, in this case it looks like the hundred thousand dollars goes to the whoever's oh, the intermediate school district and then the intermediate school district links the students up with uh, state entities that they can intern in the funding is to pay for ISC to hire staff to do that coordination okay but the students don't get any of this money that's not what the grant purpose is for okay all right that's those are my questions it's, it's, it's dollars that are appropriate and uh, the help Oh, it's Health and Human Services. They should talk to the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions on grant criteria? All right. The time is now uh, 1140, and a quorum of the board is present. The Board of Education meeting of August 8, 17 is called to order of the regular meeting. We're going to vote to convene the closed session to discuss memorandum of legal advice regarding Open Meetings Act with council. Before we break for lunch, I'll entertain a motion to convene this closed session. So, so moved. Support. 
It's been moved and supported. Any discussion? Marilyn, please call roll call. Vecto? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Ramos Fontini? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Albridge? Yes. Weiser? Yes. Siley? Yes. Unanimous. So we'll come back at one o'clock.